All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. So tonight's topic is streamline affordable housing. So this is a public workshop. We are actually live streaming this. We're aware of at least one person in Australia who's been stuck over there with their the quarantine, who would have liked to have been here, and uh, others might tune in as well. I do also want to thank um, the members of the, the community, and uh, we even have a community housing provider here as well, and the media for hanging around. I know we're running later than we had anticipated starting, but do appreciate you staying, staying on to, to listen, and also take it as quite a good sign that some of these uh, people in the audience behind us were actually at the community-led development HUI last week and got a... a a glimpse at some of the stuff we're going to share tonight. So the fact that I've come back for a second showing is uh, a really good sign as well. So elected members, you received a, a, a paper, a discussion paper at the end of last week, which just, I guess, gave a little bit of a recap on where we have um, come since we last presented to you. But importantly, and the reason why it's a workshop tonight, is there is some direction that we're seeking from Council. So we're having that workshop to, to get that. So essentially on the screen there, in summarised form of the five sort of key questions we would like to, as officers, leave tonight, having a, a good sense of direction on. So the, the first one there being, Copes will take you through, I guess, where we have landed in terms of the design work. And we want to know that you're comfortable with the level of density, the prescription, and the rules that we're potentially compromising to, to get that density. We also want to understand um, I guess your level of comfort as to where this initiative might apply. And we've signalled at this stage that we think uh, Levin, Foxton, Foxton Beach and Shannon are the right places to start. We're keen to understand whether there's an appetite to propose any incentives to making this happen. And then we've got some questions around the engagement approach that we'd like to take. Are you comfortable with that? And then that has a bit of a direct influence on the, the timing of this program as well. So keep those in mind as we, we move forward. And... COBUS will now say, okay, we go through, uh, I guess, a bit of a recap, but also there have been some tweaks and changes as we've gone further and deeper into this work, and COBUS will step you through that as we, as we go from here. Thank you. Can I check this is working? Yep. yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me back. I'm always a bit nervous, as you know. <laughs> Um, and uh, But David did say you're in a good mood and that I've got as much time as I want. <laughs> I'm just confirming that. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, and uh, just wanted to take us back to basics. And a lot of people have contributed to this. David, his team, Cynthia here, uh, several of his uh, staff have contributed Brent staff uh, and Kevin uh, and we've had Joe Fletcher in the mix um, and uh, and also Mr. Wallace um, and so uh, just want to be sure that that's understood that there's been a broad contribution to this. The other thing that's really important for me uh, is that we always just take ourselves back to the purpose and the purpose really is not about developing buildings. It's about servicing people's needs in your community. And we've had that uh, very much in mind, and sometimes we've got to remind ourselves uh, just what that is so that we just reset our framework if necessary. Um, a byproduct, we believe, will be uh, that if we can get this to happen and get some affordability and a wider choice of housing and smaller dwellings, which is, of which there's a shortage for you, uh, in, in this community that we'll also get a general increase in housing, um, that which is good for everybody, um, and that it will, we'll also have a more informed... And so we've had, many, we've had many good bits of progress, I suggest, in this bigger dialogue with both the development community and council, and indeed uh, the, the, the inputs that you as a council gave us. Um, again, just to be really clear, we don't even know who lives in this house. We're not picking on this person, but we just wanted to locate this in some sort of reality. Um, and so please forgive us, whoever lives there. Um, uh, but we just used that as an example because it's of a certain lot size which reoccurs quite a lot. We've tested other lot sizes as well. But the classic condition is that you have many, many houses of this nature in zoned areas and we think that's 
a fantastic opportunity. Um, and, and the thinking is if you were to replicate that house just in a model, uh, already having, if you were to have some dwellings behind it, in this case single-story dwellings, um, it may look like that. If they were double-story, they may look like that. Um, and that both of those are actually quite benign in terms of their impact on the bigger environment. Um, and, and that's very important for us because we are at the same time very concerned about impacts on neighbours, impacts on the character of the street, and to get good livability in the dwellings. Because you can have people living there and we can still make sure they get good living conditions. Um, and as part of the bigger process, how do we make this more efficient and more affordable uh, in order to uh, deliver that on that uh, objective? David mentioned um, where and getting your approval of where we think this uh, could apply for Levin. It's the in the residential, um, uh, including the median the overlay should suspend, is this zoning in and out? Should I, can I clip it to my beard? Or, um, it's just going to be a tender here off, off to the side, so if it's either a little bit higher or you check the whole body rather than just your head. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll go in a straight jacket. Um, so, uh, so, we've, so we want to exclude though, the town centre and, uh, and that opportunity that, that uh, is coming uh, towards you about a rail station. Uh, and so those two areas are excluded because we think they may actually deserve a higher density than this current thinking. For Foxton Beach, uh, again, the residential zone, including the density overlay, uh, which, which is uh, indicated there. Uh, and then uh, for, for Foxton itself and for Shannon, where there aren't any medium density overlays, obviously the residential, existing residential zone. And so that's the proposition of where this applies, uh, and we'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. Uh, in terms of the three documents that we're preparing, and this will be the last one we put together because it's actually more, almost more conversational, um, it's, it's a, we're calling it a brochure, and this is to explain to everybody why we are have done this project um, and, uh, and also how it works and, and where it applies and who can apply to participate in the project um, and, and then what the process steps are. This may be as much to developers who want to do this as it may be to a resident um, who is through this process being offered a life chance. It may be a, a very elderly person who doesn't really have forward options uh, and almost stuck in a house and, and, and has no way to, with that asset to find a different future. And, and if this can actually help unlock for them the ability uh, to end up with some uh, other properties or, or intensification on their property of which they may end up living in or, or they may just take the benefits from that and do something else. Um, so we want to talk there for those residents, for their opportunity, as well as to the development sector, but also to the general public, uh, just in terms of uh, them being assured uh, that we've taken care about uh, the, the impact. Um, and, and so we'll have in that uh, examples and lots of other examples of good, uh, good potential outcomes. We, the second document is a guide, and so we believe it's not good enough just to go and try and change some rules. We have to help the development sector step their way through this. Now, uh, some people will read this thing once and never pick it up again because they'll get it and they'll do their own thing. Uh, but you constantly have new people coming into the mix, uh, and we think this is in terms of, of communicating uh, and taking people through the whole process. And so in simple terms, there'll be an early discussion. Somebody comes in and they see whether they pre-qualify um, and get to understand the rules. I need help on this because I'm zoning in and out. I 
can hold it. I can hold it. That'll work, won't it? Will it work like this? I'll do this. Um, so the, then when, we, uh, when, when people have gone through the pre-qualification, we want them to understand the approach and just how this works. It's a little bit complicated in the beginning, and then it's really easy once you understand that. Then want to get them back, go away, do a very uh, uh, conceptual design, come back to council and have a conversation then. And if we can clear things up then, uh, there'll be a much smoother pathway uh, downstream and into the future. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, stepping through uh, 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 that process through to application. And then, and then there'll be a conversation around whether this gets notified or not. And I'll come because we uh, have... Um, uh, have Thing we can to try and action. All right. I will go to this one. Thank you. Great. Does that work? I give up. Um, and so then uh, dealing with the actual, we also doing a very special kind of application form. Um, and it's, if you want to, in simple terms, it's a tick box approach with a lot of homework behind it, which has been reconciled within council, which we believe is going to make it much, much easier for an applicant to work through uh, with a whole series of, effectively, series of pre-agreed uh, approaches. In that guide, we want to give some help just to designers uh, without patronizing them. Uh, but just about some critical decisions. We've learned a lot going through this. We've done dozens and dozens of designs. We just want to uh, give the key bits of wisdom to help them easily work their way through the design. Uh, and it will be about, do you retain the existing dwelling? Which side is it easier to get through? Which side is the sun? Um, and uh, where do you want to? And you want your outdoor spaces to have solar gain. Um, and, and if it's on the other side and how you deal with it and, and, and some of the clever ways, you may still get a good outcome if you have different conditions to deal with. Um, and, and in that guide, other illustrations of, uh, of just how you achieve some of the other outcomes, getting the outdoor space, getting indoor-outdoor flow, getting the outdoor courts, um, and how you deal with balconies and such. Also on the site planning, we've done a lot of engineering work and, and the, your engineering uh, team have contributed to a lot of really good thinking which is now more refined in terms of access ways and, and how we don't waste space but still remain effective in terms of transport and movement. Um, and, and then there'll also be a series of examples which have been worked through for people to borrow from every situation will be different, but they'll learn something from that. We'll just offer it almost like in an appendix. Um, and if you look at this, this is an existing house with a single story at the back, then double story, a couple of double stories at the back, or a new house in the front, but it may actually be a, a house split down the middle, like semi-detached, um, which gives a certain kind of efficiency. feels like a big house, but it's actually too brand new gives you four dwellings where you used to have one. Currently, you can only do two on this site. And that's the big positive that is unlocking the affordability uh, in this process. Um, and then you may have um, two sites. Um, and, uh, and, and in this case, you can see how two sites converts to uh, quite a large number of units uh, uh, on those two sites. Um, we'll also just give a whole series of ways you could lay out the buildings without uh, telling people which ones to choose. But again, just to be helpful, in this case, single-story dwellings, and they all achieve the intentions of the design, double-story options. And you'll see they all look a bit different, but they achieve the intentions of the design. Um, and even some walk-up apartments, <coughs> which, um, uh, which may be uh, something that actually starts happening uh, in, in your community more. Um, and then we'll give them just a whole array of any of the other examples that we've uh, worked on and tested. 
And so all of this is about being proactive, being positive, being constructive, trying to stimulate them to do the right thing, offering little tips and clues at the front end, um, but then also walking through all those rules that they will have to deal with, uh, or currently have to deal with, and, and the specific approaches that we suggest um, are, are, support, are approaches which we'll support. So those rules, um, and I'm not going to go through these with you, just so, but just so you get a feeling for them, just a whole array of, of all the issues, planning issues that you have to deal with, and height, and bulk and location, and, uh, and, and separating distances between buildings, and so on, and so on. And so the middle column is the approach, the right-hand column is the current rule. So we've been very systematic about where, how that works. Um, I'm going to give you a summary in a second, but just to say there's more of this, um, and you know, it's rubbish collection and letterboxes and trees and, and, and then vehicle maneuvering, on-site parking, uh, access way lighting, um, and, and then through to the more uh, uh, serious uh, engineering issues uh, to do with stormwater, to do with wastewater, to do with water supply. And to give you a little summary of that, the areas where we are less restrictive than your current rules, in other words, we break your current rules, are, are the number of lots that you can have on one, number of dwellings you can have on one lot, currently one extra behind an existing house. The coverage, we deal with the coverage through giving a lot of attention to the stormwater because that's the biggest consequence of coverage. And, um, and, and the space between buildings currently, because if you want to do terrace houses, they've got to attach, so we've got to break that rule. Um, and outdoor spaces, currently you've got very large uh, outdoor space requirements, which aren't appropriate for medium density. And then the other one that we also bring in is the possibility of the ability to do three stories, uh, but with neighbor's consent. Um, if some neighbor doesn't consent and the application comes in and the planners judge it still not to have uh, uh, any serious effect on that neighbor, it may be that the council decides not to notify that. So there's still a discussion to be had. Um, and so these are the things we break up, uh, up front. Uh, and, and the things that have stayed the same, and we've worked really hard in the beginning, we, we kind of broke every rule possible. Um, and, and then we realized that, that some of them were just unnecessary. We weren't getting more lots, or we weren't losing lots by retaining an old rule. And that's become very important for us because we've taken legal advice, and the legal advice is the, the fewer of these rules that you break, the better chance you're going to have uh, in terms of surviving this from a legal challenge. And, uh, and so height to boundary is the same, boundary setbacks are the same, the front yard is the same, parking requirements are the same. Those are very important because they, they are the things that really matter to neighbours and, uh, and we want to keep the peace in the neighbourhood um, because we want to keep cohesion within the neighbourhood. Um, the thing, we're actually in some cases, very few, but we are actually more restrictive uh, in one particular case and that's the step back from the street itself. Uh, and I'll show that to you in a minute. Then there are a whole host, and if I had to list them, it would go off the page, of technical, uh, let's call them acceptable solutions, um, agreed solutions, technically. Um, and for that, again, I need to credit the engineers who have contributed tremendously towards this, and, and we're still working through uh, some of the finer detail. But this means that instead of having the conversation on every single application, we're having the difficult conversations right now, coming to a resolution, and forever on from then, those are acceptable approaches. Um, and that will save a lot of time, a lot of aggravation, and a lot of consultation money for every applicant to go and find somebody else to go and prove something which may have been proven dozens of times before. Um, and, uh, and so these, uh, I'll touch on a few of those uh, when we go further. 
The other thing we've done is we've then modelled um, if we take this approach and we do our worst in terms of this approach on a site, how much worse can the effects really be compared to the current rules? Now, they are worse to a modest degree, I suggest, uh, against the normal rural rule, and I'll explain that in a second, uh, but they're actually better than the current medium density overlay rules in terms of having less impact. That's terribly important, and the lawyers were very interested in this because that would be part of the defense. So we're being very responsible, I believe, uh, in this approach. Um, and and uh, there's a whole lot of stuff listed there, but, but the more important stuff's in the red here. So if you imagine you've got a site and you've got, let's say, a height to boundary condition, and, and, and that's the sort of angle that goes up, and you can build up to that angle. Under the current rules, there's, if we take uh, medium density, which is this column here, um, You'd get, uh, you'd get an exposure, and the first floor one's actually the important one, of 43 meters where you could theoretically be sitting right on that boundary running uh, at that height legally, but pushing it right to the limit of the legal. So that's an impact on the neighbor. They can do the same. That's a legitimate, but it's an impact on the neighbor. If you measure that for our rules, we actually get a lesser running length of that condition, which means we make less impact because we've got other requirements in the mix. The outdoor courts, uh, you've got an access way which takes you away from the boundary and so on. Won't complicate it for you. But that actually says this is a very responsible, I believe, uh, responsible in its impact. And I think that's very important because in the long term that uh, will tell in terms of how the community accepts this. Um, and so you're getting figures like you know, 34 meters compared to 46, compared to 40. That means we have a lesser impact than in these conditions, even here, 38. Um, in those conditions, 42 uh, compared to you know, 43. Um, uh, and it's a bit more than the 36 and the 35. Uh, but but on, 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 on that particular example, 39. So these are very moderate differences. And so this is a bit of boring kind of research, if you like, uh, testing that we have to do to give the process some rigor. Um, and then just to give you a flavor, again, won't read through them uh, in detail, but here's one of the ones where we are more restrictive. Um, and so this is the application guide. This is where we are explaining things and being helpful. This is the application form. It's not that photograph. It's just a form. It's got a tick box, uh, and you'll see later, if you tick a box and you're breaking a rule, we give you the legal justification which you then use back to council. So it's quite cunning in that sense. Um, and this case, this is the one case where currently you've got typically houses located about that distance, six to eight meters away from the boundary. That's a historic thing, and you've got lots and lots of houses that are set back like that. Now, we can currently, your, uh, you can go up to four meters. I'm just cautious that if we come with a venture like this, we want to keep the goodwill that if we go right up to that front two stories and then, with permission, three stories, that that stands out so radically in one of those streets that you get a lot of pushback from the neighborhood. Um, and I don't believe it's necessary. We've tested these and, and we can achieve the numbers by actually saying, well, in this case, not the general rule, but if you apply this package of rules um, that we want you to stay single story for an extra two meters, then jump up to two stories. And if you're going three stories, another three meters back and then jump up. And we run scenarios through those, and uh, it's not punitive in terms of the numbers. But I believe it's responsible and, and, and kind, if you like. I know that's not a popular word anymore, uh, but kind <laughs> to the street uh, and somewhat to the neighbors. Um, and then, so for instance, um, this is about uh, outdoor courts, and we've been very uh, modest in our requirement, three and a half meters. In Auckland, it used to be six meters. Now it's a little bit less, sort of circa four meters. 
we understand, we try to find a balance with um, uh, affordability. Uh, and we also know that three and a half meters is the same distance if you have a double story and you hit the height and boundary. And so we're just, being, we're just being sensible, making it easy, making numbers coincide so that you can just work with this stuff uh, in, in, in a way which is not so complicated that you waste time and energy uh, and, and cost. Um, and so uh, if you uh, tick that box which says I'm doing this, which is different to the rule because I'm following this approach, here's my AE, my uh, assessment of environment effects. In other words, here's my legal excuse, and we've written it there, and by ticking that box, you're offering that excuse. And so we're given the, giving the answer to the applicant, but only after we've all you know, considered that to be a, uh, an acceptable answer. Uh, same thing again, looking at, uh, in this case, um, access ways, um, and, uh, and, and the fact that we are diminishing the access ways so they're smaller and smaller as you go down, that helps on those tight sites, but it's got a common sense. When you're deeper down, there are less vehicles using that access way. They accumulate when they get to the top, so you have it wider, and you've got enough space to pull people off the street so you don't have accidents on the street. So there's a lot of common sense safety applied to this, but the current rule has a wide thing which goes all the way down, and sometimes it diminishes the number of houses that you can get there, and it's not needed. And so we've had great input from council staff working with, and I need to mention Ray um, uh, O'Callaghan, who is uh, helping on the engineering side uh, and played a strong role in this. Um, and so in the application, you tick the box uh, of what you're doing and how it's working, uh, and then the, the, uh, the legal excuse is given to you, the AEE. Um, there's some work, and this, this is still being refined, but stormwater is a big issue for you. <coughs> We're taking it seriously, um, and we know that there are different bands of soakage that happens, and, and soakage, the soakage values of the land is very important from an engineering perspective. Um, and, and so you decide where you sit, and so we, there's still a bit of work happening to, to make this easy for people to know which zone they're in. Once you're in a zone, you can see different colors here. They, you, you get given a graph. Uh, you, you decide uh, what, your, uh, 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 if, what your depth of, sit, of, of soap pit is. You pick the right graph. You come to an answer. It's pre-calculated uh, on a professional basis. Um, and, and if you've got a different uh, pit depth, then you've got a different outcome and so on and so on. So we're really trying to make that easy. But it's been done professionally and, and, and yeah, at, at, at the back end will be fully signed off by council. Otherwise, it won't go anywhere. <coughs> and, and then there are typical examples given in that application of which you may choose to do. You'll still have to go and do proper drawings and all of that. And you're still going to do proper building, uh, building consent drawings. You're not freed from that, but this is at the land use application stage. Um, and so that brings me to the end, really, of that technical part, but I hope that sort of hung together. I tried to stretch it out a little bit, but, but I ran out of things to say. That's a joke. Um, uh, and so I just want to move on to uh, maybe to, to David back on the engagement. Thank you, Kovis. And, and hopefully as he as Kovis talked through that process, you for those who might be a little bit more familiar with the standard application process, you started to pick up on some of those those key differences, which is why this is quite an innovative approach. So the fact that a lot of the design work we're doing now is saving the applicants from having to do it for themselves. So they're not going to have to get their own urban designer to provide a statement as to why they might be going a bit higher or, or getting more buildings on a the site. They're not having to go get their own stormwater engineer to, to get the calculations to design a stormwater solution because, again, that work's been done and, and they can pick from the, um, the suite of options. So those are all things which I guess we've heard in previous conversations, um, even the developer forum at the end of last year, that was one of the things that came back was, you know, how can we reduce, give some greater flexibility, but also reduce the reliance on, on some of the experts, and the, um, the, I guess the experts that are needed to, to create some of these solutions. What I want to touch on now is, is around engagement. So as part of this process, and it's important to remember at this stage, we're not actually going through a formal 
district plan change process is simply looking at how we can refine the current process and, and provide some, I guess, added assistance. So at this point in time, we do feel it's a, it'd be a good idea to bring the community with us. We want them to come on this journey and, and I guess, embrace the, the step change that is potentially um, the community could see. We want them to understand this is a, a potential solution as a direct response to the work that's happened through the Horror from the 2040 strategy, the sort of issues and concerns we heard there, again, through the, the Housing Action Plan, and then, like I referenced earlier, the Developer Development Forum at the end of last year. So we want the um, community to have an understanding of the reasons why we are we are doing this. We want them to understand the opportunity that this creates within the community. But we also want them to understand that, that change that could occur as well. So as part of that, and you can see the project objectives which we want to get across there, um, we're just trying to, I guess, help people realise that this is a good thing and we're trying to do it in a sensitive and appropriate way, which does help achieve that solution of more affordable houses, but also still gets good outcomes and good livable spaces as we go. So we're proposing a, pro a process that would allow for opportunities for the community to have that sort of two-way conversation with us. Uh, we want them to be able to have that opportunity to talk both from a, a personal interest point of view, if they are looking at doing this, but also maybe if they have concerns about what's proposed or, or want a better understanding. So at the moment our preferred approach would be to do some online communication where we put a lot of this information, make it in a way that people can digest and, and get an understanding, but then complement that with some drop-in sessions where we make ourselves available for people to come and talk to us, as I say, and that's sort of where it can be a bit of a two-way conversation and we can talk specifically about maybe their property or, or their street. At this stage, like I said, because it's not a formal plan change process, it's simply a, a process where we're looking to refine how we do things. We would get feedback from those sessions, but I wouldn't see it going through. At the moment, I'm not proposing that it goes through a formal hearing process. Uh, we would get that information, analyse it, and, and use that to sort of inform or refine any further work that we might need to, to do in that space. We'll come to getting your views on what we've shared in a, in a moment. Um, the, the other aspect that I'll, I'll talk to is around incentives. So we obviously have heard the message from from yourselves and also the community about we need to be doing something on this housing space, surely there's something that, house, that council can do. We've looked at, I guess, the settings and, and conditions and what we can do to, I guess, see more of these proposals developed. And so tonight we're actually, I guess, testing whether or not there's an appetite around the table to incentivise that further through, I guess, potentially financial offsets. So I've just put up some options there. Um, obviously, we've stayed away from putting costs up at this point in time, specific costs, wanting to, I guess, understand where there is an appetite for us to maybe explore these, and in which case we can then um, cost those up. The first um, little three examples there are ones which are probably around getting the, the opportunity happening um, and a good uptake early on. So potentially, say, the first five approved eligible applications, uh, they maybe go, go through with no fees, for instance. Uh, the second one under discounted fee, that's where that would be a more ongoing arrangements so over a period of time if you're doing one or two bedroom dwellings perhaps that gets a certain discount on on your fee um, and as COVID said we've done a lot of work to try and avoid this and then needing to go to hearings because we recognize that adds time and also some cost to this but some may go there and again whether or not there was an appetite to maybe cap the, the fees for hearings so again there's some certainty in, in what that might cost people there. So have a think about that. There's certainly probably other options out there that you might be interested in if you were interested in incentivising. We think the, the proposal has a lot of merit, but we obviously want to see an uptake and uh, feel there's an opportunity for Council to, I guess, really send a message that it is trying to do something in this space and that it may wish to, to incentivise it as it goes through. So in terms of timing and programme, so we are at this Council workshop at the moment. We are seeking some, some direction. That was quite important to us because next week we have the developer forum and we would like to be able to talk to, I guess, where we are headed with this and, and even the time frames that we're working towards. So at the moment we're working on a program which would see us sort of finally finalising uh, some engagement material. And again, that's subject to your, your direction around engagement, whether you make that big, small or otherwise. Um, we'd like to undertake the engagement, analyse that feedback, then see ourselves starting to finalise that documentation and with that there would need to be some changes to our internal systems and processes. We have had a really positive meeting with our legal team going through this and they obviously do want to have a very close look at the wording that we're using at the end, particularly from that angle of predetermination. Um, we obviously want to make sure that 
we don't send any signals or make any commitments that we can't, obviously um, we're outside of the process. And then there's a bit of a question around what sort of sign-off from, from yourselves as council would you like this to go through before I guess we do press go and, and go live. Like I say, if it was a plan change, this would be bringing it to you for adoption to notify and so on. Um, this is different, this is more, I guess, around internal processes and, and I guess how we run those and our interpretation of certain rules. Um, but would like some guidance, I guess, in terms of what your expectations are around, I guess, giving us a go ahead to, to go live with this. When we're at that point, we would like to do a what we've called a training workshop with interested developers. So that might be the mum and dad developer or person who's thinking about doing this. It might be those regular people who are actually going to do this on a, on a more frequent basis. We would like to spend quite a detailed session with them so they go away at the end of the night having a really clear understanding of how they can actually use this process to get to the outcome and uh, understand, I guess, the, the ways it differs from our, our usual process. An important step is also engaging with EWE and community housing providers around the opportunities. Uh, whilst the opportunity isn't sort of specific for, for EWE um, or even community housing providers, we do recognise that there could be opportunities for them to take up within this and want to make, them a, make sure they're aware of that and have a, a good understanding of where they could maybe um, utilise this, this process. And then if we did follow that programme, we think uh, realistically we, that would be, we could be in, able to go live with the new process September, October. As part of that, we again think it would be worth doing some publicity around making sure people are aware of that new opportunity. And then an important part of this is actually doing a, a review and it's difficult to know the speed of uptake. We might find between now and the end of the year you only get a couple. Uh, we might find we get quite a few, but there would be a point in time where we do actually want to review, have we got this right? How's it going? Could it be improved in any way? Because this process that we're going through here is almost like a test run for Plan Change 7. If we get it right here, it simply basically gives us all the evidence um, and the basis and the new rules that we then want to bring through as a plan change next year. So final final slide um, does bring us right back to, to where we started. So you've, you've heard from COBUS around some of the technical information and you may have some further questions there. And then we've just quickly covered off um, around incentives, around engagement, around program timing. And it's uh, sort of answers to those five questions, or I'll have them more detailed in the in the briefing paper that I've provided, which is where we're looking for a steer and a sense of direction to know what our next steps are and, and where I guess we take this process from here. And it may be easier if we do just approach them in, in order of, of questions, I think, just so we can keep track of where we're at. So we'll start with the first one, and that is, so you've seen from what Kate has talked about, essentially the level of density, the level of prescription, um, we identify the specific rules that we are breaching at this stage to, to achieve that, that added level of density. And we want to, I guess, test whether or not you're comfortable with what we would be potentially signalling to the community as a, as a with a step change. Thank you. Thank you both. Very exciting. And uh, interesting, just two sort of housing 101 questions from me. Um, do we have, it talks about level of density prescription and the rules that we've compromised. Do we have a national description or a local description of what affordable housing is? Like, do we have some sort of a an identity for that? Question number one. And then these buildings would attract development contributions. There's no, that, that sits there alongside of these developments. Take the second one first. Um, yes, it, it is the policy stands at the moment, um, but again, my recollection is you've provided an opportunity for consideration for where you may choose to um, not require development contributions. So, with some pres uh, you may recall through the Housing Action Plan, we did set a um, housing affordability target. Um, so it is in the Housing Action Plan. I don't have the figure on the top of my head, head but I did scan it today and there is a, um, a percentage ratio that was related to income and cost. So it is in the Housing Action Plan if you want to refer to it. So something has answered the second question for me. Um, may, I, may I just comment on that please? Um, I think, you know, it may have been more precise to say 
more affordable housing as opposed to definitely, definitely affordable. Um, because as we know, almost anything new, just by, by the fact that it's new, is already quite difficult to achieve. Those standards, those parameters of so many times per salary, you know, housing costs, it's, it's very hard to achieve that with anything new. But where this, this counts in, in two ways. One is that often it's somebody who's sitting in a three or a four bedroom house but has no pathway to buy anything smaller. And even if they buy something smaller that is of a higher square meter value than their existing old house, but it's half the size, that, that that affects trading down and that they have a surplus of income or, or asset value by being able to trade down. Just that opportunity of going to a one or a two bedroom apartment. Um, and, uh, and, and I think the other thing is why we put a lot of emphasis on the community providers, they, they do uh, through their, because they're not for profit, they go to great lengths uh, to build housing at a lower cost. And, uh, and there are people in the room here who, who are experts at that, but, but uh, there's some figures probably in the, in the order of 20 or more percent lower sales cost from those, and I can verify that, that's just a figure in my head. And, and the reason is they get benign finance or patient money, they are not for profit, they sometimes uh, get their contributors working at 20 percent less. Are they not really competitors to the private sector because they work, they have a criteria which they apply for people who qualify, and those people have to be in need, and they also look at the character of those people because they want to protect the social quality of, of their, you know, of their neighbourhood. Um, and so that's, these are some of the sort of more nuanced ways where this, I believe, will help in terms of affordability. Um, David, in terms of um, the prescription, I mean, are we creating something that um, I mean, when people get told how to do stuff, they generally don't necessarily, they want to have the flexibility to change things. So how prescriptive is this? And the other question I suppose following off from that is, are we creating the cookie cutter type of housing that's going to all look the same and, um, you know, thinking back to the 50s and 60s state houses, they all did look the same and now we're, um, you know, they're not necessarily that attractive for uh, the long term um, and just trying to get my heads around how that would look. I'll have a first go and then Cobus will follow up. So the, there is a level of prescription. Um, currently, to do median density development, we have a, a very prescriptive design guide, and that's been some of the feedback we've had that it's too prescriptive, it's, it goes too far. What this process is trying to do is, I guess, strip out a lot of that and work out what is the most important thing to get a good level of amenity and to get the right, um, I guess, orientation and, and, and building outcomes. And so it's taken out a lot of those things. Yes, it's got a level of prescription around trying to get those key things, and Encodus has highlighted a few of those things, things tonight. And I think because this is largely, um, will quite often be used for, um, I guess, existing infill sites, um, you will sometimes get that existing dwelling stays. So that in itself is going to create a, a level of variety as well, because you get the existing house at the front or maybe at the back, and then that, that space that's left will be what's, what's used. Yep, you will get some people who do the example where you maybe have two sites and you take everything off. Um, but I think because it's... It's largely going to be done on infill sites. You are still going to see quite a variety, and hopefully you can recall that diagram that, or that picture that Cobus said, where there's just multiple different sort of design options. Um, we aren't just channeling people to one or two and say this is all we can do. There's actually going to be quite a myriad of, of different ways people can still get an outcome on a site. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I don't like the word prescriptive, uh, and it was David's word. I never liked it. Uh, and uh, it's not, <laughs> we're actually not being uh, descriptive because if you look at what we've done, we've actually relaxed a whole lot of the rules. Uh, we've brought one or two in, the one about stepping up because we want to be careful uh, with, with the street character. Um, but uh, uh, if, if you look at, uh, you know, these are all 
different plants. Uh, and, and we could draw another six of these just for that. These are single story. We could draw another six of those. And so there's an infinite variety. What may make some of them similar is that the edge conditions and, and the, the sort of framework that you're working in pushes you a little bit towards um, similar fundamentals. Uh, you know, you've got an access way and you've got a driveway in that sort of puts the garage in a particular spot and then you've got to deal with the height and so on. That's not prescription. That's just the framework which you currently have in your roof. So I'd, I wouldn't be nervous about that aspect. I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things which can happen already uh, in a variety of, of, of approaches. Um, Dave, could you go back to the screen that had the tables of the, the different rules, please? Um, um, uh, I think it was the next one where you had the sort of um, the summary, yeah. Yeah, so there was a reference to parking requirements to keep them the same. I was under the impression there was a, there's a national policy statement that basically saying you can't mandate parking requirements anymore anyway. Um, Yep, so the, the National Policy Statement for Urban Development does require us to take out car parking requirements um, at the moment. So that we, we'll have to take those out of our district plan. There's the current rule which requires a certain number of car parks on site. Like I said, at the moment we're trying not to change anything in the district plan. We're just simply trying to use the process. So at the moment the car parking requirements are still part of the plan until we remove them. And what... I guess COBUS is highlighting is at the moment we aren't uh, making any change from that. So we would still be able to comply with those um, at this stage based on the designs that, that COBUS has done. Yes, in time those parking requirements will come out and we won't be able to require on-site parking. Um, and so we'll, in some cases, be catered for on the street. So the question around that would be that if you did deal with this through a plan change to remove some of those rules that are problematic, doesn't that then translate into allowing for potentially more site coverage and more optimisation of the land? Uh, that's yeah, uh, can I answer that? Uh, yes, it will. Um, but you also have to factor what the consequences will be. Uh, I have a slide, it's hidden, I can unhide it, uh, where I was actually on site uh, with Paul Twyford, who's been delegated the urban design elements from Parker, Minister Parker, on parking and these conditions. And, I was, and he asked me in for commentary about a month ago. Uh, and we were actually on site, and there was uh, one of the three-story buildings, five uh, terrace houses, which could have been five apartments. And he's also mandating for the Tier 1 ones that you can go up to six stories, at 30 apartments. And this was down a cul-de-sac just behind the Attitude Town Centre. And I said to him, Minister, can you step back for a minute? You've now just mandated no parking. Uh, and uh, and there, there could be 30, this building could have 30 apartments in. Same height, same everything. That's 30. If people did still have one car per apartment, which is more than one person per apartment, that's 30 cars. Now step back and look at these sites. There were at least 10 sites that could do that. And I said, you're standing at a street which now has to cope with 300 parking cars in this street. Have you thought that consequence through? And he said, oh, we're not going to change the rule now. I said, well, they're going to make you Minister of Parking, which he didn't like, which was my shallow humour. But, but the, point, the point for me is that I think we've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, in the end, if it's a law, it's a law. Um, but you just got to think of the consequences too, because that will come back to you very quickly. Uh, and there'll be instances where you can fully justify it. I think close to the station, close to the town centre, you might be able to say fine, or people have a choice, or you may. But uh, at, at this point, it's not law yet, and we're working with your current rules. But I think that's a, that's a conversation you'll have to have again during Plan Change 7. I'm sorry, I just had one other um, question, which was around, and I can't remember if it was this long-term plan or previous, the previous annual plan, but I seem to remember there was a submission that basically said something along the lines of, um, why don't you, when you're looking at density, why don't you look at more shared green space? 
And so, so when, I was, when you had all those maps up there before, each of those you know, properties or dwellings has um, a tiny bit of green space. And so the question is, is, is there any way that you could explore, I guess, again, optimising to, to allow for greater site coverage by having shared, more shared green space rather than each, each dwelling having its own tiny little strip, which is, in many cases, pointless? I think... Uh, I think the answer is yes, if you have, but you need a large enough site. You can't practically do it on one site. It's not that easy. You can take the fences down, but I've also been party to a lot of research around safety and usage of open space. And when you make it communal and there's ambiguity, somebody loses out in those relationships because you don't quite know where you are and where the neighbour is, and 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 then they could be. You know, there could be you know, bad social behaviour. You've got nothing to retreat to in the final instance as your privacy and safe haven. Um, but there are cases where if you've got a big enough site and, and you, you can play with the layout where you could have communal space uh, and have less, you know, have less private space. It happens in apartments, of course, because all you've got is the balcony and then the bottom space. Um, so that, that may happen, but I think you know, we here we were trying to get to affordable housing, urgently using current zone typical lot conditions. It's maybe something that we need to, or you need to consider in, again in that plan change seven conversation. This gets plan change seven makes this redundant. This goes away after we want to take all the learnings across, but this goes away. Got another question. Um, in terms of the agreed technical solutions, I mean, the district's wide and varied in terms of its different makeup and landscapes and things like that. So having agreed technical solutions over a wide area might be problematic, wouldn't it, in terms of stormwater, wastewater, depending on where they are and, and things like that. So, you know, it could... You know, today we've had the opportunity to go and see the Koyangawa houses in Montgomery Street. You know, it's slope section, obviously stormwater's not an issue, but you get different areas where it's flatter, the soils are different or whatever. Um, how does it, you know, again, it seems like we're trying to be, um, sort of almost provide the solution without that, when it, there may not be an easy solution. There is. Uh, I'm not an engineer, and and Brent and others can comment on this. But but the principle that's being worked on by Ray O'Callaghan, for instance, uh, is it, it's not just one solution. It's you look at what your soakage is. So for a start, that makes the difference of where you're at. Uh, and then for each soakage, there's a different formula for how much retention you've got to provide. And then even then, there's more than one solution depending on the local conditions. I think it's, uh, uh, there's been some really good work done in that space, uh, and I don't think it's simplistic work. But but uh, that you know that still has to bottom out completely with uh, with full approval from from council staff. Councillor David, um, do I take it tomorrow? I think that's just this is for medium density zoned areas only. No, I got that wrong. No, so we're proposing, well, the next question down um, essentially was we would like to propose this for the residential, the full residential area, including medium density in Levin, for the residential medium density in Foxton Beach, and for the residential zone in Foxton and Shannon. Just enlighten uh, me that why, the, why the difference? Um, as the Kerikeri Kerri War at the moment, you'll um, you know, visually see it. There's a huge amount of um, info, um, obviously subdividing of, of, of larger blocks, properties, and whatnot. You know. So it's already it's already happening, but it's obviously going through a, a lot different process. Um, so why the restriction on those areas? I'm sure there's um, not so much a restriction. Foxton and Shannon don't have medium density areas, so they just don't have a residential zone. So it applies. Essentially, what we're saying is. This proposal should apply to the, the residential zones of those four areas, um, noting that two of those already have a median density area.
So the, the approach is that uh, it's, you can do either just land use consent or you can do land use consent and subdivision, but you can't do subdivision on its own, not at this scale, because it's too interconnected. So you can have subdivision and you can freely you can title them. But preferably, that's, that's what we probably preferably would like. Uh, uh, Gentlemen, I'm sorry, but um, this is a workshop for us. Um, you are allowed to observe, uh, but you're not allowed to actually add commentary to it. Sorry. That's, um, otherwise, we have to go, you know, there may be an opportunity later on, certainly, to, um, to input and engage in the, in the consultation process. But at this stage, this is a workshop, okay? So... Councillor Ross probably took us there already, um, but is there a level of comfort with us supplying this initiative to to Levin, to Shannon, to Foxton, Foxton Beach? I'm not answering that question. I'm just wondering, is it realistic with the water table in a lot of places in Levin to actually even expect that sort of density of housing or coverage to actually be able to cope with these stormwater on some of the sites that you've got. You know, the, the water is really close to the surface, the surface in some parts of Levin, and somebody already said that, I think it was Bernie, that, you know, you've got those, those rules already, but it's going to actually vary according to where you are actually in Levin and your water table. I know that... Um, Pretty sure that Kevin made the comment to me at some stage that this in Levin with the type of it, um, what we've got under the ground, the soap pit idea actually doesn't work in practice everywhere. So is that taken into account? Short answer is yes. The what you it was a quick slide, but um, what you will have seen on the when Kevin showed the stormwater one is Levin's been broken into to four four zones. So I guess based on its Soakage. So, um, soak pits aren't the only part of the solution. So, for for instance, on one side of Queen Street, you'll have a different solution to on the other side of Queen Street based on the, the different soakage, and you'll potentially find that in addition to a, a soak pit on the, the area that's got poorer soakage, you'll then have potentially additional pipes within your site to actually accommodate that soakage, or sorry, the storage essentially, um, to make the soakage work. So. Ray has um, worked on different solutions here, and as I say, it's got to the point where he'd be prepared to sign um, his basic professional certificate against the, the solutions, as, as basically being suitable in the conditions that um, exist in those those areas. And that's been, we've been Ray's been working on that with both our development engineers, and um, but also with some of those in the, the local development sector to try and make sure he's got a good understanding of, of the local conditions, the different. Um, the differences between the different parts of, of Levin, where it is, it is different depending on where you are, and to come up with a suitable solution. So I guess that would impact on the, um, <coughs> you wouldn't be able to plant trees and things, would you, on these sections? It would be pretty limited if you've got pipes under the ground that you've got to worry about that are holding your water. I'm just, I think uh, I wouldn't want to say a blanket yes or, or no because I think each site will be different. You'll have seen from a few of those schematics that that code was put up. Some obviously do lend themselves to a bit of outdoor space, in which case your pipes might be at the front of the house and your outdoor space is at the, at the back. Um, but I think one thing you do have to appreciate as you go to smaller sections that the opportunities to do some of those things that you do on a larger section become more constrained. Very, yeah, a lot more limited. Yeah, and the three-storey aspect... I'm just I'm a bit nervous about the three-storey aspect in, in normal residential. So how much of that could you expect? And and the comment that even though the neighbour may not give agreement, that council could still give agreement if they felt that it wasn't going to have too much of an adverse effect on the neighbour. So just yeah, I, I'd like to know more about that. 
I think, uh, if I may uh, just comment, three stories probably unlikely on a single lot, just the way the heights work and so on. It's once you've got two lots or more lots that because you're deeper into the, because the height and boundary angles still apply, it means that that occurs deeper into the lot and you're just pushed away further and further from the neighbors. So I think the impacts will be, you know, a lot less than, than if you just change two-story to three-story under the current uh, rules. Um, but uh, but I, I think every site's different, and, uh, you know, you could have a site which is sloping, and, and the three-story is effectively moving away from where other people are. I think, it, I think that's why there still is an opportunity for... Uh, for, for a hearing, there's opportunity for notification. We try to avoid that, <clears throat> but I think it, it needs the judgment needs to be made case by case um, if the three-story application comes in, and whether staff feel justified enough not to notify it. I think there's a first question, um, and uh, uh, but but I think we've taken also taken special measures on the street to push three-storey back further than you would currently do, because currently you don't have a height and boundary on the street. It's four metres front yard, you can go up. And we are suggesting that we actually step that front one, which pushes the three-storey back out of respect for the street. I understand that, but I'm thinking about the person that's actually over the back fence. Correct. And so the back fence, uh, currently you've got this height to boundary angle, that carries on if you're two stories you're here, but if you're three, you've got to be even further away to still hit that angle. So there's a degree. Still see it three stories, but it, it pushes it back further. There is a degree of softening that effect. I think that's it's sometimes easy to think Levin, as an example, is, is flat. There's parts of Levin, if you think about Churchill and things like that, where maybe the site is elevated, so actually three stories down here actually the, the person up on the higher ground isn't actually going to be as affected. So sites, there will be different situations. And it's, it's certainly we, we did look at it. There was a, a you know, desire to see, you know, would this be an appropriate step change? Is it the right thing to do? Is, it, is there a way we can make this where it basically could almost be sort of non if I want to go through the process? And we, we realised that it was probably pushing it too far. Um, and so we have sort of scaled it back and, and Campus has worked hard to find a design solution which we think would be a, appropriate, um, but it's obviously going to require different site characteristics to make that happen. Right, the next thing I'd like. To, oh, sorry. Oh, okay, is it, we're, st we're still going, are we? You got more to do? We're up to basically going through the five questions, so I was just about to jump onto the third question, but if you've got some. No, no, you go, go, I'll wait till the end. Thank you. I'm nervous now. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I, I took enough, there was enough nods on the heads in terms of where we were looking to apply it. Um, I've certainly picked up the feedback around um, some of the, the level of density and things, and I'm feeling comfortable with how we're looking to address that. The next one was, was there an appetite to incentivise this in some way? And those were just some options, but you may have other ones which you want us to either consider. Yeah, look, I'm just not sure on this. I just need to understand in reality what that will do um, because I think the package is hopefully quite inviting of its own accord and that just feels with respect just a bit random you know I'm just not sure what what difference it will make but this is where I need to hear from people who have a lot better knowledge than me around it so it's really a, a challenge rather than a negative at this stage. Um, I would be inclined to be in favour of the capped fee for hearing so people know what they're up against. Um, I'm kind of more with Councillor Allen around the fact that this looks like quite a good package. Um, if it really is, let's uh, run it up the flagpole and see if it flies kind of thing. And wait, you know, the feedback will tell us that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the whole overarching uh, push behind this is to is to give some surety, and and I think um, rather than creating a lobby scramble for the first 
ones through the gate. I think what the community is after is is something that they can um, propose and know where they stand from the outset, so they know what the parameters are. I'd like to see a, a cap fee, not just not for a hearing, but for the application, mm, so that right. that you can then, you know, when you've got a front up to a an option or buy a property, you know for sure what your business case is because at the moment. There's one big open-ended out of the room, which is the consent. And this is the whole idea. We're trying to bring that down to say, hey, you know, this is the, the rules of engagement, and, and these are the costs of that. And, and if you can uh, fashion a, a design around that, you can pretty much lock into a budget where you go, and then you can progress this stuff. But it's the grey areas which cause... The pause, and I think um, if we can commit to saying, yeah, no one's after a free ride here. I just, they just want surety, you know. So if we take that direction, would be comfortable with us sort of going away and doing a bit of work? Obviously, we haven't had one of these proposals yet to sort of know, but we can look at similar things and, and work out some time. Um, there is obviously a fee deposit already sort of identified that, that would apply to this. So we worked out some, some costings for that, what we think it could do, and that could be something we could bring back and, and some direction could be given. Does that seem reasonable? Would you want to cap it at something lower than um, obviously what it, we think it might come out at? And, um, and sort of potentially that could be an option that we, we take forward. So just for certainty, the principle is about capping <coughs> uh, applications and hearings. It's about a cap overall for certainty. Good. No, that's good. So just... Making sure we're all clear, I would see probably two caps one for if it's a hearing, which would generally be more expensive, and, and a lower cap for a non notified one. Okay. Right? Which is a wee bit interesting because the only reason you go into a hearing is you're going outside the rules, which pretty much you know you're saying on your own. Um, but certainly, if, if, if there's a signal there that I a hearing has got a cap on it. Um, I think, yeah, I think one of the things I hear back from people about hearings is they just see, um, as you alluded to, Councillor Bishop, an open potential checkbook of payments that are just never going to end and maybe no result, whereas if they know that they're um, going, potentially going outside of the rules but within a framework that is encouraging of development, and uh, they might have to make some compromises as a result of a hearing. Um, they still got some. There's some motivation to go forward with with the plan. Thank you. That's a really helpful direction. So the next one is around the engagement. So just go. We just go to the engagement slide, please. So this is where we. Some messages we do want to get across. We think it would be a good idea to socialise this with the community. It's more sort of engaging and informing as opposed to sort of getting there and trying to or sort of I guess do a whole lot of technical work um, and proposing those two different methods sort of an online means of communication, um, but then also allowing for some face-to-face -face, um, drop-in type sessions. Where you know, in my mind, it's a couple of us officers going to, to some of places like Siawaho or. And, and, and being available to, to walk through some of these options and whether that's an opportunity that someone's interested in exploring or someone actually wanting to understand what, what might um, play out in their street, for instance. How does that sit with, with people as a way of, I guess, socialising this before we sort of go live? Um, yeah, I'm happy with that. And um, Just under the heading method, I think like, what I would like to see is some sort of mail drop or you know, letter or something to anybody that would be potentially captured by this because I think it's really important right from the outset that you're taking them along for the journey um, and that they are given every opportunity right at that front end to engage in the drop-in sessions, you know, actually understand what it means for them because if you don't, then, and, you know, we get to, I think the timeline was September or towards the end of the year and then you're dropping it on them, it's... You know, there'll be, there'll be people that will say, well, I didn't know about the online stuff, I didn't know about drop-in sessions. So I think just setting that early indication is really, really key. 
just to confirm if we were to, because we're saying it applies to the residential zone, if we were to do a letter drop, for instance, to all those in the residential zone, make them aware of the opportunity to, of engaging, but also a bit about what's happening. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm just saying, I think you definitely need to, um, we need to do engagement with the community and I think it's, we need to target, target the areas that are, um, that are affected myself. Um, so 100% we need to do that. A little nervous. Um, target those who are, who are affected, that's a, that's a whole town, that's a whole, that's everybody. And... And I think we really need to be real careful with our messaging. Again, going back to first principles here, why are we talking about this? Because we've come to an end of how do we deal with the unaffordability of, of housing in this district. Rents might be heard tonight. And, you know, same as Palmerston North, um, property that's going up at 20% year on year. You know, we, two years ago, we had the housing affordability forums. We set up 360,000. Well, 40% has gone on that already. So we're already well into the late 400s. You know, um, the story about this is a push to try and, and supply to the market um, some affordable homes. That's the only way you'll keep the cap on it. It's volume we've got to bring. And it's either you go intensive in town or you accept sprawl, you know. So messaging is real important because we're trying to, you know, with, get the community to think a bit more maturely about what the future of this district's going to look like because of the, the population pressures clear and present. And to have any, you know, you know what it's like when you, when you open up for consultation the types of people who, who engage, the, the NIMBYs and the notes, you know, it's pretty tough going. And if that's what your basis of your, of your projected um, policy is going to be, going to be uh, based on its potential whole of wasted effort. Not saying that you, sorry, not saying that we want to consult. It's just the story. It's just packaging the story really clearly. And I think back in comment there, um, you will have heard me sort of use the words inform and engage rather than consult because I think it is important. This has come, there's quite a good evidence base that it's got us here in terms of some of those that the Community feedback we've had around the Horizon 2040 strategy, around the housing affordability, um, and again more recently the development forum, that has given us and put us down this pathway where we're, I guess we've essentially been trying to tick off these things that have been raised with us. So I don't feel we're back at that point of needing to, is this the right thing to do? It's more around informing this is, this is the direction we're going, this is what we can anticipate, this is an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely agree. It's the messaging. I mean, this is us being responsive. And it's us thinking about being an, an enabling council for our district, and we've talked about growth and enabling growth. Um, and I think also the messaging around we want people to stay in this district. We want young people to see it as viable, to be here. We're short of workers in this district. You know, I mean, I've been talking to employers, you know, newly established businesses like Thermostat, who talk about they had to buy a motel um, in order to house some of their workers here. We want their workers to come and feel that they can find a good place to live. It's, you know, it's bigger than just providing houses. It's about all of the well-beings that we talked about tonight when we adopted the long-term plan. So I think yeah, the messaging and linking it back to that is really important. And could the messaging be like a community connection that's pretty much committed to this one thing? goes out rather than a whole lot of stuff that's happening at council, I don't know, or the major part of it, because that goes to a lot of people. It doesn't go to Foxton Beach, though, does it? Does it go to Foxton, the Chronicle? Does the Chronicle go to Shannon? So, wherever it doesn't go, we've got to do the, we've got to do a drop. It doesn't go to quite a bit of the horror phenomena. Uh, certainly we we would, uh, obviously the community connection does give us a, a good platform that we get to feed into. I think that's one means that we could use. Um, there might be other things that we can do through the, um, I think we're doing drop-in sessions where we again would advertise those in the paper and there might be some additional stuff um, that we could do through that way as well. Um, if I can just go back to the iwi part of it and the word papakai that it's been up there. 
So how will that be captured? Because if you've got papakaunga being built on Māori-owned land that's going to be for hapu use only, then they will not be buying and selling property. But will this, will they be, are they able to be part of this process? And then you've got papakaunga, which will be built on land purchased within the district where you'll have developers, chips, Emhard and all those guys being a part of. So, you know, when you use those words together, they're actually quite different depending on who's funding those papakaunga options. So that language might have to be fleshed out a bit better for when that goes out for public consultation as well. So, unless I'm wrong, we haven't used papakaunga in this presentation. Um, it's it's something which we are aware of and certainly through there for um, the housing action plan, the Pacifica, Pakanga, um, is, is housing and housing solution we need to, to look at. Haven't seen this piece of work specifically addressing that because this is really geared towards that infill type housing. Um, Papakainga, um you might be able to do some this way, but really it's a different sort of opportunity and needs to be explored through through a plan change. Um, and it is part of that sort of broader plan change seven, which we've talked about in terms of looking at that wider a, a range of housing opportunities and solutions that we're trying to address. So, in, in this case here, it really probably only serves EV if they have access to, to land within one of those residential areas, um, which basically has a, an opportunity like this. Um, quite a bit of Māori land is outside in the rural zone, um, so it's a sort of a different opportunity to what this is promoting. Okay, so, so I guess my point is, is that if some of them read this, then they might make their own assumption around what that could possibly mean for them in that space. That's all. Does that make yep. more sense? Yep. Okay, thank you. That's going to a good steer on engagement. So the last one was just around program. So I think we developed this based on sort of undertaking some engagement along the lines of what we had outlined and so I think uh, you haven't taken us too far away from that which means I think we could still work to that, that time frame. Is there a level of comfort and probably the key question in here is what's the expectation around council we'll call it sign off um, as we sort of advance this having had some community engagement having been through our legal review having sort of finalised the documentation what's that sign off look like from, from council for us to be able to press go live and make this opportunity available to our community. Um, I was just thinking, would it not just come to a council meeting as a report and or is, does it not need anything as official as that? A strategy or, or making a decision to Essentially, from the from this, we'll have a process in place, oh. documentation that we'll be wanting to say, right, let's, let's go out and start this with the community. And I guess I'm wanting to, to test. It's not a plan change as such, where there's a prescribed process where we actually need a council resolution to, to adopt it. Um, it is largely, as we've talked about, internal sort of processes, but there are some, some things which we've obviously got your direction on tonight. Um, so I don't think strictly it needs council approval, we obviously want to know we've got council support for it um, and I guess wanted to check we, our expectations or, or what your expectations were so we didn't miss a step in this process and particularly in terms of our planning of, of perhaps everyone here expecting it to come back to a, a formal council meeting and to have some sort of you know, ratification around it versus um, essentially council giving approval or, or sort of being comfortable with the direction we're taking and, and sort of last rolling out the process from there. So David, in general I support it, I think it's a good thing, I think we've got a problem, we're trying to address it. Um, to me this is, if we can hit those those time frames you guys are talking about, which are up there, um, that's roughly when we, I think we need to, if we want to be able to assess it in time before we do our plan change next year. Um, but I think, oh, I think we do nothing, we'll get the same result, so... We've got to start looking at things like these, and I, 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 I think it's, I think it's a good thing, and I think um, we should just be, we should be cracking ahead with it. And um, as I said, because we can change it when the 
in, in the plan change comes next year. It's a bit of a trial as far as I'm concerned, and, and I, I like the direction we're going in, and I feel that um, you guys are listening to us, which is great. Um, yeah, look, uh, I'm very supportive of it and want to be enabling as much as we can and it really would only be what process do you need to follow in terms of if it's a required endorsement from us or a meeting process that needs to meet, you know, any of the required processes outside of that. It's great. Go for it. I think, though, David, it would be good um, if Council did ratify or endorse the strategy as a whole, um, because I think it sends a very good signal to the public that we are enabling and that we are trying to uh, fix the solution. So I wouldn't like us to think from this meeting that we're actually then giving you the endorsement to actually go right out and start the process. So I think it does need some sort of endorsement for us. All right, thank you. That's very helpful. Coast, any final sort of remarks you wanted to cover off tonight? No, just a general thank you. And again, I just want to reiterate uh, the staff and the input that's come in from, from uh, the technical staff and senior management getting their people behind us. And also just a note on the developers spent a lot of their own time uh, in the developer workshops uh, and that was a, a, a pretty cool process to the point where some of them were saying, why aren't we doing this right across all uses, right across the whole district plan? That's not possible. But for me, that was a very constructive attitude that started coming out of that developer workshop. But thank you for, for the tolerance. <laughs> thank you, media, members of the public. Um, Great to know there is some interest in this and certainly appreciated the feedback we got in Shannon last week. Um, like I say, because a few people have been contributing to this process or have even approached us without knowing about this process, we are aware that there is interest in the community already. And so, I don't know, there might be some who even try before we get this process quite off, off the ground. But uh, it's great to know there's people who are committed as, as much as you are to trying to, I guess, make sure housing and, and particularly the one and two bed type housing, that gap is um, actually filled within our, in our community. So thank you, that's some really helpful direction tonight, I do appreciate that and thanks for your time.